This is a production of Cornell University. So, um, I'm part of a, of a uh, research group that is uh, very much interested in endomorphogenic fungi, in particular secondary metabolism of this uh, group of uh, organisms. Um, uh, why uh, this interest? Uh, well, the main reason is because these fungi are used in biological control. And the biocontrol, it's a kind of uh, a reverse, it's the opposite of the interest that plant pathologists usually have. We would like to know how to kill something better. Plant pathologists are more interested in how to protect a plant. It's kind of reverse. But at the end of the day, what we both would like to know is how our favorite organism works and what makes it uh, virulent or, and dangerous or beneficial in our case. So these are just uh, three uh, quotes, well, I would say, about biocontrol. Uh, generally speaking, we want to something, something that is more virulent to control better our pests. Uh, we would like to have our biocontrol agent to be uh, more um, resilient in the environment and to avoid collateral damage, so to not kill what we do not intend to kill. And also not to kill who uses this biocontrol agent like the farmer. Some biocontrol agent may produce toxins, for example. So, so I was talking to you about, uh, uh, before we are interested in, in metheridium, and this is just to uh, relate to you a little bit. This phylogenetic tree is, uh, is, uh, describes uh, an hypocreating clade. In red, you will are, uh, these clades are basically uh, entomopathogenic fungi, divided into three major uh, see, groups. But what I would like you to just focus, besides these red uh, clades, is that on top of here you find Fusarium, Gibberella, Trigoderma, things. Uh, organs probably you are very well accustomed about uh, with. Also interesting is that in this sea of red, uh, you will see also some green things here. It's the Claviceps epicroi clade. Basically, these are renegade fungi. They probably were uh, little pathogens and they revert to back to the uh, plants either as a plant pathogen or are endophyte of grasses in the case of apicoi. And they bear a lot of uh, resemblance to metaregium and other uh, pathogenic fungi. So why do we focus on this uh, organism? Why metaregium robertii? Uh, this species, and in particular this strain, is one of the most studied uh, endomopathogenic uh, fungi. There are others. But this is for sure one that has the most, the highest interest. is a generalist entomopathogen. One thing I forgot to mention is that among these entomopathogens, th there is some sort of special specialization. But many, many times you can see just a preference uh, towards some insects versus the other. This guy infects about 700 different species, at least that's what's reported in the literature. Some are more. Um, uh, sensitive than others. The sexual stage, it's uh, its known, it's uh, very rarely observed, it's called metacorticeps, you never see it, just a picture on the web. Uh, so we are dealing with a, a basically a conidial rep reproduction in, 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 in most of the cases. And the molecular basis of environments have been explored, we know something about this guy, but uh, not too much. I think I forgot to turn this on. Oh, much better. So, uh, as customary, I should talk to you about the life cycle of metaridium, how this guy infects uh, its hosts. And this uh, life, cycle, life cycle is really, really simple. It starts with the conidia landing on this poor little fellow, this <coughs> larva, and uh, 
germinating, producing a prosorium tube, uh, um, sorry, a germ, a germ tube and then a prosorium, and a penetration structure. The penetration structure goes through uh, the cuticle, the insect cuticle, the insect skin. Now, the difference between this cuticle and the plant cuticle is that this is really, really thick and is acellular and is made mostly of proteins and chitin cross-linked many times with some phenols and it can be as tough as uh, a shrimp shell. So it can be really tough, not always. So its primary target, the primary target of the region is the hemocytic cavity and the hemolymph, basically the insect blood. When it reaches the insect blood, it switches, uh, there is a morphogenetic switch, it changes from filamentous to yeast. These yeast-like forms are called blastospores. And they disseminate this uh, fungus throughout the, the hemocellic cavity. It almost works as a blood uh, infection. It doesn't target, as far as we know, any specific organ. So it goes throughout the insect. And to put it simplistically, just kill, makes it sick, they kill it. We don't know exactly how. Uh, basically, when the, the insect is, uh, uh, is dead, the fungus outgrows grows back outside on the surface of the, of the, of the insect and is correlated. So you see these mummies covered in this, in case of uh, there is a green, green stuff. They're kind of gruesome to see. And then the cycle starts again. Now, we have uh, sequenced the genome of this, this particular organism. And uh, what I'm going to, talk, going to talk about you are just few specific uh, uh, pieces of this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the entire story. And uh, particularly these two, these two, uh, I, uh, these two uh, uh, topics. One is about carbon source preference and toxin production. And uh, also there is something about, well, this is an important topic, but I'm not going to touch about uh, today because um, it would require too much time. But it's the avoidant uh, detection by the immune system is also kind of important, and we are uh, looking at it. So, uh, just to show you uh, something about this this, uh, this fungus, uh, the genome of this fungus is uh, this slide is to tell you about the fact that this is just an average as to my a genome of 40 megabases and uh, has a number of gene uh, models, protein coding models, 12,400. And uh, so it's more or less what you expect we have from our average as to my Now, my goal during our goal during this work is to try to understand what makes what makes metarhizium metarhizium. What what is the difference with metarhizium and other fungi? So to do these comparisons, I felt we felt that uh, we need to have a, a large panel of fungi to uh, basically uh, refer to. Uh, the more the, be the better. Here is the list of 48 fungi and four uh, uh, bacteria that I use throughout uh, the study. Uh, they have different lifestyles, uh, and uh, although this has to be taken with a little bit of uh, caution, because many of these fungi are yes plant pathogen, but they can be opportunistic. Animal pathogens, uh, some entomopathogens show endophytic capabilities, uh, and so on. So this is a very uh, rough classification of these reference genes. Now, if we look at the uh, one way to represent what's peculiar within a within a uh, genome is just to find a relative abundance of 
some uh, protein classes, some functional classes, uh, like uh, proteins, uh, carbo carbohydrate acting enzymes, secondary metabolism, and other. Uh, the just uh, showing the relative abundance like that, as in this case, uh, metabolism is significantly enriched in proteases, peptidases. It's interesting in itself, but it doesn't tell the entire story. It doesn't make you allow you to make really uh, com contrast and compare and tell what set this fungus apart, if anything, from other ones. Is it just uh, gene composition and protein potential, or the way these proteins are regulated. So what I'm going to show to you is something I, uh, a technique that I've been trying to use, and then suddenly I found that other people are trying to use, so I was pleased that I was on the right track. It's the use of principal component analysis to reorganize this uh, uh, these proteins and to try to uh, correlate their presence with them with lifestyle. So principal component analysis is just for few of you don't know about it, it's a way to reduce the dimensionality of, of your problem. You start with in this case 29 dimension trying to define lifestyle and uh, uh, principal component makes a linear combination of these variables. Uh, and uh, produces basically what are called latent variables or components that allows you to synthesize this very complex complex uh, problem in a, uh, in a uh, simpler fashion. The interpretation is a little bit different. but So we have that these 29 protein classes have been summarizing two components that uh, harbor, uh, explain, sorry, about 60% of the entire variability. So it's, it's very, very explanatory. And what is remarkable is just using PCA on those groups I showed you before just as a relative abundance. Uh, you can see that, for example, the entomopathogen tend to group, tend to group, tend to stay close together. Uh, plant pathogen tend to be here. Uh, in this other side of the, the plot, and uh, here there are some animal pathogens, the yeasts. So basically, uh, just dealing with the relative abundance of some protein classes, you can reorganize and describe a little bit lifestyle. It's not perfect because, as I told you, also the, our classification of lifestyle is, is not, it's not, it's very rough. An alternative way to do this, to, to look at this on the other side, is that before we cluster, we put together the, 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 the we use basically just the uh, independent variables that were holding classes. Here, using hierarchical clustering analysis, you can do both. You can cluster the, the, the variables, but also you can cluster, see how they the, the effect clustering of the of the of your data set. Just uh, you don't need to look too carefully at this. You just look at there is a dendrogram here and there are beds. Basically what you can see is that just using rough classification in peptidases, glycoside, hydrolysis, these fungi can be grouped together a little bit like in PCA. And you can see the entomopathogens grouped here as they were grouped before using the PCA plot because they share more or less same kind of relative composition of these proteins. Here are most of the plant pathogens and some subgroups. Here are our bacteria that are completely different. They are almost an outgroup. Uh, there is one entomopathogen here. There is a, a, always a little bit of an out outlier. Here there are some animal pathogens. So it's a nice way to, at a glance, tell apart stuff, uh, tell apart species. I was quite, I mean, I was really surprised that it would work so well. Now, if, oh, let me go back. 
if we get to analyze some subgroups, for example, like lipase and glycoside idolase, they were particularly interesting for other reasons, and look at the, at, the, at the families within this larger group, family of lipases, you can see that the story repeats itself, and the entomopathogens tend to, again, cluster together, and the plant pathogens are here. And even more, if you look at glycoside idolase, this, 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 uh, this uh, phenomenon is even more marked. If you look at polysaccharide active enzymes analyzed using principal component analysis, you can see how separated these uh, species are. They are of the bacteria, yeasts, animal pathogen, entomopathogen, uh, microparasites, plant pathogen, and subgroups. Wow, that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> but even more explanatory is, is uh, the, the, the other phase, the other side of the analysis that can be conducted with uh, hierarchical clustering, in which you can see also better how these uh, fungi cluster together when you use these uh, many, many uh, glycoside hydrolases and the other carbo carbohydrate active enzyme as a clustering. Uh, variable. And you can just see how these clusters are organized. You can almost see the bands here. How uh, some uh, bovaria, sorry, some endomopathogens are clustered together and they both miss some things here and they have instead more of something else that you cannot read because <laughs> you have to go up here and how the reverse is true for some plant pathogens, well, the plant pathogens are down here. While, as expected, the yeast have almost nothing, very little of uh, uh, hydrolysis. And the same is for the animal, uh, some animal pathogen, the, the mother pathogen. So, if we look and zoom in and try to understand what's more and what's less, what are these holes here? You discover a very interesting thing that you could not discover just with enrichment analysis. Is that most of the families that they've been missing in uh, metharizum and in uh, other entomopathogenic fungi belong to this uh, uh, glycoside idolase family. So you can read what they do usually. Uh, for the most part, this is a summary, there is more, but basically what's missing there are enzymes, carbohydrate active enzymes, they degrade hemicellulose and pectins. So, and then I wonder, is that true? That, that, does it have anything to do with reality? Does it, is it really so bad at growing on these uh, substrates? And so, if you see uh, if you look and compare Gibberella and Metallitum Robertia on polygalacturonic acid, it basically is pectin, is demethylated pectin. You can see how Metallitum Robertia after seven days grows relatively bad compared to the, to the growing on just glucose. So it's 10%. And you can see the, the culture here. Here's uh, Metallitum glucose, this is polygalacturonic acid, 1%, same amount of glucose. 1%, so it barely grows there. It's, it doesn't like it at all. The same on hemicellulose. It doesn't grow. This is on glucose. This is Fusarium uh, graminearum, that is known to be able to grow on this uh, substance. So that's one thing that tells, distinguishes metarizum and other entomopathogens from uh, the bulk of uh, fungi, subgroups, and special pathogens. But there is something that also they have that other fungi don't have. It's been said over and over that they are very rich in uh, metarizum and entomopathogens, are very rich in peptidases and uh, chitinases, which is true. They are a lot of them and they needed to penetrate through the thick cuticle I showed you before. But also trigoderma has <laughs> out of those 
peptidases or glucanases, and it's not an insect pathogen. Uh, and also, what is interesting is that, just a digression, in Trigoderma, for example, this swot of chitinases have been shown not to participate very much in microparasites. Something else. Next time, microparasite. What uh, metarhizium and uh, some other uh, animal pathogens have that other fungi usually don't have, not all, is these three classes. This basically release monomers from animal carbohydrates. Particularly, this is interesting. Uh, I'll show you something about this before. These, these are single genes uh, that they have and, uh, uh, and uh, entomopology have and other fungi don't have. But a single gene can make a big difference. Uh, this seems to be acquired by horizontal gene transfer because it's very similar to some bacteria. This, I'm not sure. Uh, this is very similar to animal uh, poly, uh, sorry, hyaluronorase lyase. Why it's, it's really interesting? Because these are pathogenesis factor in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, in bacterial, animal bacterial um, pathogens. In particular, it's Staphylococcus, and there was another one. Uh, deletion of single uh, PL8 just knocks it down. Um, it's much less virulent. And uh, it's been shown that this, this uh, uh, Enzymes basically facilitate penetration and spread of these uh, of, of this, uh, 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 bacteria, and um, and provide also uh, um, monomers uh, from hyaluronate to uh, that facilitate growth. Without that enzyme, looks like they don't do very well in connected tissues. So this was uh, something I, I told you about uh, what metalizium, what is the preference of metalizium and other entomopathogenic fungi regarding carbohydrates that are very important carbon source. But one thing we would like to know is uh, how does metalizium let's say, infect and kill itself? What are the pathogenicity factor? Well, I can uh, tell you that we don't know very much yet. I, we have hints I will discuss to you about now. And the framework here is a classic paradigm that reminds the difference, uh, the, 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 that reminds the uh, biotroph and necrotroph seen in plant pathogen. Uh, it's been said that some entomopathogens are stealth attackers, so they penetrate, they sit there, they are not recognized, they grow, and then where the biomass is too large, they basically the, the, the insect dies for depletion. Uh, another is a kind of shock and awe. Uh, the fungus penetrates and uh, immediately kills the, the, the host and uh, grows on the spores. It's not sure what really happens, but we know that it's probably something in between, really. One remarkable thing that the genome tells us is that this uh, uh, genomes are enriched in, in uh, uh, really, well, in, in homologs of bacterial toxins. Usually these bacterial toxins Bacterial toxins, what I mean is uh, animal pathogen, bacteria that are animal pathogen. Uh, usually they are multimeric, they, are multi, they have multiple subunits. Uh, what we find in, in, the, in, the, in entomopathogens are just some of the subunits. It's not really uh, clear what their role is or what their action and function is, but it's remarkable to see these may be in all these genomes. So their similarity with bacterial toxins is low but significant. And as I said before, in most cases, only some of these subunits are found in, 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 in metalism and other 
just to give you a breakdown or uh, a summary of what these toxins do in insect, uh, sorry, in uh, bacteria, you can see a plethora of, of, of uh, really uh, nasty uh, things, like hitolabaritotoxins found in, found in uh, Vibrio cholerae, in, uh, in Escherichia coli, uh, pertussis toxins is an immunosuppressant, Diphtheria toxin also is a nice, uh, not very nice toxin. And then there is bot the botox, the consumer neurotoxin that basically inhibit the re release of acetylcholine and other ones. So they are there, nobody has characterized them yet. They are particularly uh, uh, present in, in, in entomopathogen. And if you if we look at the, their distribution, there is something kind of interesting that I said before they are typical of uh, and this group of entomopathogens. But if you look carefully, there are some fungi that are completely devoid of them. But some, like my report, or even uh, uh, Cochleopolis, sometimes they have one or two copies of some of them, and it's not known. But entomopathogens have lots of them and some uh, in their uh, composition assessment uh, is not the same for all entomopathogen. What is present in Bovaria tends to be uh, less present in and vice versa. If you look at the expression, we have some transcriptome data and the expression of these, these toxins inside the beta worm the design insect host, we see that some are upregulated compared to compared to the axenic culture. They tend to be much lower, uh, express a much lower level, or not expressed at all. One uh, particular uh, specific uh, bacterial uh, life toxin has been recently characterized in Epicoi. This is very similar to insect toxins, and uh, when it's been expressed or expressed in, in in bacteria and fed to um, actually injected in insect, it uh, was demonstrated is uh, toxic and uh, as an insecticidal uh, capability. But as I said before, what one of the things we are interested in the most uh, in this fungi is uh, secondary metabolism. Uh, <coughs> Does the uh, secondary metabolism have a role in metabolic emergency virulence? Well, I have to go back in time a little bit and tell you that until relatively recently, uh, this particular compound extraction is a uh, non ribosomally uh, synthesized peptide was considered the toxin of metabolism and so on. Uh, why? It's been uh, known for many, many years. Uh, it's uh, mildly insecticidal. Uh, it's uh, produced by some strain in, in, in vitro, in a sometimes large, in large amounts, and uh, it's been correlated to the preference of the, of the, of the, of the uh, pathogen, which means that uh, usually, uh, insects that are more sensitive to destruction have been shown to be even more sensitive to the, to, the, to the fungus. So, oh, this is the toxin. Well, we have characterized, uh, uh, knocked out the genes for uh, the, the synthesis, the synthesis for all of these three, uh, uh, three, uh, all these three compounds. Basically, we have minus strains for each one of them. And, uh, sorry. And basically, none of them made any difference in the in the virulence. They are as uh, as uh, virulent, I would say, as wild type. Really, you can you can hardly see any difference at all. But I go, again, going back to the genome, what we know is that uh, the this fungus is really loaded with secondary metabolite pathways. It's uh, 
has many BKS hybrids and uh, ribosomal peptide synthesis and uh, and uh, terpene uh, biosynthetic genes. So there is we have a long way to go to uh, rule out the uh, the the participation of secondary metabolism to any facets of the of the of the of the disease. Uh, it's true that many, many, many uh, of these pathways are unknown, but uh, metallicus also show that there are a few of them, and there are just two, uh, look, have tantalized similarities to known secondary metabolite uh, pathways, like uh, the ergot, uh, biosynthetic gene class in claviceps. Uh, there is a gene class that is very similar in metallism. And uh, this, there is this other uh, pathway that is almost identical in, uh, in Penicillium atiopicum, and that this has been characterized, produces um, uh, tetracycline like compound that is antibacterial. Uh, but for the rest, it's really difficult to, to, to make sense of what uh, they might be. And also, oops, I don't know what's going on. <coughs> this works, and it doesn't work. I don't know. the expression of many of these uh, a sample of this secondary metabolite in vitro and in vivo you can hardly spot uh, a difference so this is a time course of the expression of vast majority of uh, NRPS and uh, BKS NRPS hybrids uh, in Spodopter and Zico that is an uh, insect and uh, so Time courses between 24 hours after the infection and 120 hours. This is the not inoculated control, the not inoculated insect. This is the GDNA control just to see if the PCR work. This is on cuticle. And here is in, in axonic culture and um, in conidia. Uh, to get a good amplification on, uh, from insect is kind of hard because the amount of insect, the fungus tends to be uh, low. But uh, you can see whatever is expressed in vivo is expressed in vitro. Uh, and whatever is not expressed in vivo is not expressed in vitro. So this is a little bit, I have to tell you, um, disappointing for us. Because we really like secondary metabolites. But there is another way to, quick and a quick and dirty way to have a, a rough idea of what the secondary metabolism does. Uh, and is the deletion of these uh, PPTAs. So, why? Uh, PPTAs are required to activate basically uh, uh, most of the secondary metabolite genes, and RPS and PKSs, uh, not the terpenes. And without these genes, the, these uh, proteins are inactive because they cannot add <coughs> the phosphopantene modification at the distillation uh, uh, domains. And basically, they are there, but they are not functional. So once you remove the right uh, phosphopantene transferase, uh, basically, what you have is that the old NRPS and BKS are gone. 
Also, what you have is lies in absorption. Basically, what, what happens is that uh, the fungus is not able to synthesize lysine. They don't produce siderophores. And as I said before, the secondary part of the secondary metabolism is gone. Uh, and here, how is the PPT1 mutant looks like? Uh, this wild type pigmented is completely uh, white. Uh, that's a telltale that the, 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 the knockout uh, worked. So what happens there? If you look at this uh, basic to the mortality, to the survival in time of uh, insect inoculated with one type, at this level of inoculum, you have the day seven 75% of the insects are dead. With PPT1 mutant, there is almost no uh, mortality. Uh, so PPT1 mutants are nearly uh, non-virulent. And since we do those responses, we can uh, um, assess the potency of, of, the, of, the, of the two uh, organisms. What I mean is that using those responses, you can calculate how much inoculum you need to kill 50% of the population. And a rough calculation tells for the white type you need half a million chlamydia for the million to kill half of the population in this particular condition. While for, for the PPT1 mutant you need 25 times as much. So it's very much a thing. You need 25 times more chlamydia to, uh, in theory, to get to the same mortality. So, uh, in this uh, presentation, I try to ex present to you uh, information about uh, uh, metaphysium and what the, uh, the genome tells us on its ability to survive and uh, what the virulence factor, especially toxins, can be. The conclusion is that uh, metabolism of Mercia has expanded the repertoire of peptidases, secondary metabolites, and uh, enzymes that allows it to thrive on animals, of course. It's very less adapted to survive on plant, which was a surprise, compared to other fungi, of course. And then the secondary metabolism is required for pathogenicity. I forgot to add this on the, on the, on the on this slide is that also what is characteristic also is, is the large amount of bacterial uh, like uh, toxins for which we don't have any idea of the function and have not been characterized by anybody. Uh, with that said, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, people from my lab and my unit and uh, collaborators we talked to and every work worked with in the past, uh, and special thanks to Gillian uh, for her support. With that said, I will take questions. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.